Raise your hand if you hand-selected all of the musical artists you listen to. Now raise your other hand if you believe that radio spins for a record are determined solely by a well-intentioned DJ looking to provide the best music experience for everyone listening. For those of you with at least one hand raised, today you're going to learn all about the music industry's dark secret. Who's in the mood for a little Billy Joel this morning? We're going to rewind back time to the 1950s to begin this story. By the late 1950s, popular Cleveland DJ Alan Freed had built a name for himself in the music industry as many believe he coined the term rock and roll. But it was in 1959 that he was fired from his job during US congressional investigations into the radio business. Including Morris Levy, a powerful figure in the music business who owns record companies and record stores. Mr. Levy, federal authorities were describing you yesterday as the godfather of the American music business, the connection between the mob and the music business. What do you say to that? There is no connection between the mob and the music business. At all? I don't believe so. Alan Freed was connected to a man named Morris Levy. Levy was described by Billboard magazine as one of the record industry's most controversial and flamboyant players. All Music described him as a notorious crook who swindled artists out of their owed royalties. Levy falsely took writing credit in order to receive royalties, enriching himself at the expense of many of his signed artists, especially black R&B artists. Morris Levy was nicknamed the godfather of the music business for his powerful reach throughout the industry. He didn't admit that he was mobbed up, but people at the time knew he was. I got to talk to you today about Morris Levy. Morris Levy, another Jewish guy who was extremely influential in the music industry back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. As a matter of fact, his reach was so extensive that Variety magazine called him the octopus because his reach, you know, in accordance with the, the role that he played, he wasn't, you know, one of the major labels. He had his own label, Roulette Records, but his reach in the industry was so extensive, they called him the octopus. Morris Levy ran an independent music label named Roulette Records, which he co-founded in 1957. He was a founding partner of the popular Birdland Jazz Club in Manhattan, and he owned Strawberry's record stores spread throughout the New England area. But anyway, he had a record label called Roulette Records, and he had a couple of different things that he would do, um, you know, a couple of different scams that he pulled that netted him you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. He was really, really a heavyweight. He also had a chain of stores called Strawberry Records that he owned. I believe there were 60, 70, maybe 80 stores at that time. And a couple of scams that he was able to pull off quite successfully with the help of his organized crime connections. Morris needed to compete with the major labels in order to break his artists. Traditionally, independent labels like Levy's Roulette Records have a hard time competing against major labels due to insufficient resources and relationships. You were indicted yesterday on three of the 117 counts. The indictment says essentially that you and a New Jersey mafia figure, Corky Vastola, uh, arranged to have somebody beat up because they owed more than a million dollars to the big record company MCA. What about these charges? They're not true. They wouldn't have been filed yesterday if I had joined the witness protection program. With Morris being an influential member of the mob and a powerful man in any industry he looked to take over, Morris would sometimes use might to make right. Given that he was making millions of dollars throughout all of his businesses, he was able to simply pay to break his artists on the radio. Morris Levy was arrested yesterday at the Ritz Carlton in Boston. Federal officials say he's the godfather of the American music industry. Levy is the president of the successful Strawberries record store chain here in New England. He's also the founder of the Ro Roulette Records. Federal officials allege Levy uses his ties to organized crime to control the record industry. They say they were led to Levy following this man, Gaetano Corky Vestola, a reputed organized crime boss. The mob was deeply tied to the music business at the time. Between the money, power, and connections they maintained, they were able to control the industry as they saw fit. Dominic Chiafoni was a New York mobster with a long history in the Genovese gang. In addition to investing in and setting up an office at Roulette Records, he served as business manager for the New York Radio Union Local 1010 of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, overseeing the union's contracts with radio and TV stations. Chiafoni's presence at the label became problematic as it attracted the attention of the IRS, as well as local New York City and FBI investigators who were curious as to the relationship between the mob, unions, and record labels. Around this time is when the government began and connecting the dots between the mob and the use of payola. Section 317 of the Communications Act of 1934 requires broadcasters to disclose to their listeners or viewers if matter has been aired in exchange for money, services, or other valuable consideration. The announcement must be aired when the subject matter is broadcast. Within the context of today's video, payola is giving the radio DJ money for him to play your artist's record in hopes that the artist will gain popularity from the spins. 
doesn't sound too harmful, right? Basically, everything in our life is pay to play if you really break it down, but payola is illegal and has a powerful effect on the music industry as it can control who gets popular. Roulette's problems with the government began in the late 50s and early 60s during the so-called payola scandals. While the practice of the $20 handshake was well known in the record world, by the late 50s the general perception was that the entire practice of paying for play was getting out of hand. Independent labels at the time viewed payola as the opportunity to compete with the big bad major record labels. It would be like paying Instagram a little change to get your posts to show up in the explore feed, a little little more frequently than someone with millions of followers, but DJs started to get greedy after acknowledging how much leverage they had. DJ Alan Freed was particularly egregious in this practice. He famously insisted that Atlantic Records pay for a swimming pool at his new suburban home, but then snubbed the label when it was suggested that he ought to favor their discs in return for their lavish gift. What many people don't realize is that the music you hear on the radio is not correlated at all with talent, skill, or what the people really want to listen to. The music you hear on the radio, even today, in all likelihood, was paid for in some way to be heard by the masses. This isn't like the Little League World Series where you need to win locally, win your district, win state, then win your region in order to make a trip to Williamsport. You've probably noticed how a lot of artists just explode out of nowhere and all of a sudden have a song playing once an hour on the radio. They have a million dollar music video on rotation and have an album with legendary producers. This is Nicki Minaj speaking about Cardi B on her radio show, Queen Radio. Because she has built her career off of sympathy and payola. These two have a long feud going, so maybe you're thinking Nikki just said this to throw shade at a competitor. Well, someone on Twitter dug up this video of Cardi B explaining how she first attempted to make it as an artist during one of her live streams. My manager thought that like that record was, was very commercial, and for my own money, my own money, I pay sixty thousand dollars so they could, you know, try to play it on the radio, on the, um, on mix shows, and it still didn't win nowhere. And every single day, I used to, I used to curse my manager out, like, "Yo, bro, I cannot believe I spent sixty racks on this song." I should have put it, I should have put that 60 racks on forever. The beginning of this video was detailing payola practices back in the 50s and 60s, but it's still very much alive today. The radio has always been a pay for play system, even if the form of payment is something other than a $20 handshake. A number one radio hit cost $200,000 according to one label head. Coach K, co-founder of the hip hop label Quality Control, talked about the price of radio promotion at the recent Revolt Summit. Sure enough, in a session that featured the rapper 2 Chains and Coach K, who helped found the label Quality Control, known for breaking Migos, Lil Yachty, and Lil Baby, there was a brief but provocative detour into the cost of radio promotion. Everything costs money, it's the way of life, Coach K says. Radio is no different. When you sign an artist, they're like, so when am I going to radio? The executive continues, to take a record that y'all see on the radio become number one, that's $200,000. I'm actually shocked that he said it only cost $200,000. It must be only $5,000 for a good artist then. Shopping Migos, Little Yachty, and Lil Baby to the radio stations would have been like a heinously ugly man thinking he was going to get a lady of the night for $200 an hour, but she negotiated to $800 an hour after noticing the Cheeto residue on his shirt and his unattractive demeanor. Let's get back to Alan Freed, the DJ who would have asked for an entire neighborhood in order to spin Futures records. Freed was fired from WABC on 21 November 1959 when he refused refused to sign an FCC statement that he never received funds or gifts for playing records on the air. Freed's refusal and his high profile made him the main scapegoat at the FTC congressional hearings concerning payola in the record industry. Freed's radio career and concert business was over after the payola hearings. He was blackballed from the music business. There was a big case, I think, with Alan Freed, who was a huge DJ at the time out of Cleveland and New York. He was involved in some payola scam at the time. So. That's one thing that Morris Levely was heavily involved in. Alan Freed was the DJ who took the huge hit back in 1959 for the payola scandal. After essentially losing everything, he drank himself to death a few years later without a penny to his name. One day a man offered me a hundred dollar bill to play a record and I asked him to leave. It's the only time anybody ever tried to bribe me. People who worked for my record company were commissioned to pay disc jockeys to play records. It was normal, it was legal. We declared it. Uh, it was not illegal at that point, it became illegal in early 1960s when the Congress said, no more of this, it's against the law, if you, you're broken the law, you can't do it. Still goes on to this day, except it isn't as blatant, it's much more subtle. 
When Bob Donnelly entered the music business as a lawyer in 1976, payola, or pay for play, was standard in the radio industry. When I first started, it was hookers and blow to help get songs on the air, Donnelly says. Then that disappeared and it became sports tickets, trips, sneakers, and the like. It changed over time so that it became much more sophisticated. At the end of the day, the labels still wanted hit records and the radio stations wanted cash. I'm still confused as to how people listen to the radio in 2021, but if you do and you're disgusted at each radio station playing the same 10 songs, over and over, payola is why. No one will admit to participating in payola, but I think we can all agree that the talent on the radio is pretty subpar most of the time. It never went away, says Paul Porter, a veteran of urban radio who discusses his experiences with payola in his 2017 book, Blackout, My 40 Years in the Record Business. The old days of coming into a radio station with a 12-inch record full of money and offering trips and cocaine are all gone. Now everything goes to LLCs and cash apps. What happened after the congressional hearings back in the early 1960s is the input of what music was played moved from the DJs to the radio program directors. Thinking this would stop the problem of payola, it only made the matter worse. What was once a game of dealing with as many DJs as you could, you now only had to deal with a limited number of program directors. This created a new industry of independent promoters who would go to the program directors on the label's behalf. The labels were no longer paying the radio directly, they were just paying an independent middleman who happened to have relationships at the radio. Donnelly heard so many stories from fed up artist clients about payments to DJs and radio stations that he decided to alert Elliot Spitzer, then New York's attorney general, to the state of the industry in 2004. Another round of investigations began and Spitzer found that payola was still just as rampant as before. He told Rolling Stone in 2003 that because email was so new to many, the program directors and labels were very straightforward with their transactions. In 2003, for example, one program director asked Columbia Records, do you need help on Jessica Simpson this week? $1,250? If you don't need help, I certainly don't need to play it. I thought Jessica Simpson was known for her musical talents and wouldn't need a financial push to get spins on the radio. That was a little shocking to hear this. Is Aaron Carter next? Despite these agreements, pay-for-play transactions persist in the industry. One manager, who spoke on the condition of anonymity, recently spent approximately $10,000 through a third party directly paying radio DJs in the urban and rhythmic formats to play a single. The payments were strategically employed to boost the singer's spins. That was a relatively cheap investment. Another music industry veteran who requested anonymity claims that he spent five times as much to try to break a record in the rhythmic format. I bought all my spins at the right places, he says. We spent about $50,000. He got around 800 plays, mostly in mix shows. The reason why payola is illegal is because of how damaging it is to the industry as a whole and how much the consumers lose. After you watch this video, you'll probably start realizing how much of the music that's been fed to you has been orchestrated by the labels to force you into liking the artists that they want you to like. And this is even worse if you listen to the radio since the radio is basically controlled by major labels. Deep down, we're all sheep and can be easily controlled by the mainstream. There's many artists right now who are terrible but super popular simply because the label paid for enough spins. If you put a lot of popular artists today in a high school talent show, someone with the ability to tie their shoe and boil water would display more talent. In Hitmen, Power Brokers, and Fast Money Inside the Music Business, Frederick Dannon's detailed history of radio pay for play, he writes that it costs more than $350,000 to get Semisonic's closing time, significant airplay in the alternative, top 40, and AC formats. Despite that expense, Closing Time did not become a top 10 hit. Before we reach Closing Time on this video, I want to share some interesting findings I found while researching Payola since I think it's indirectly affected us all. I know you've been forced to listen to crap music many times, and it's only when you become aware of who's controlling the playlist can you recognize that you're being force-fed junk. As recently as 2014, Clear Channel's On The Verge program provided an elegant example of how Payola has evolved into more insidious forms when they require their 840 radio stations to play Iggy Azalea's mega hit Fancy a minimum of 150 times for approximately six weeks. The song went on to rack in a combined number of sales and track equivalent streams to the tune of 9.1 million. If you weren't aware of Payola before watching this video, then my hope is you can start doing research yourself into how much it affects the music business and the music you're fed through your various media outlets. When you hear someone like Iggy Azalea have a chart-topping hit out of nowhere, and your first reaction is WTF is this trash, 
your natural reaction is probably correct. In the case of one prominent radio network that allegedly has an exclusive relationship with a single promoter, he gets the ads and then you pay him 3,500 bucks, says James, not his real name, a second promotions executive with extensive major label experience. We call it the toll. Everybody has to pay it. Mainstream music is generally trash and I'd argue that most people would prefer other artists if given a buffet of choice, but that's not what the labels want. They pay huge upfront risk for an artist to blow up, so they need to recruit their money by getting spins and purchases. In June 19, 2017, the article titled Spotify Sponsored Songs Let's Labels Pay for Plays appeared on TechCrunch's blog. Well class, what was discussed in this video is an illegal practice, but if you know how to read between the lines, or in the case of this article, simply read, you will see that payola is very much still alive in 2021. Back in November 2020, this article was released in Music Business Worldwide detailing Spotify's new discovery mode feature. Artists and labels aren't required to pay anything up front for this, but by opting in, they agree to being paid a lower recording royalty rate for streams in those personalized sessions in radio and autoplay. They can opt out, and when they do, the track will continue to be played in radio and autoplay, but it won't be prioritized, and they will then get the standard recording royalty rate for those streams. I don't know about you, but telling the labels they will receive lower royalty rates for more placements for their artists doesn't sound like a bribe to me. No, that literally is a bribe, which is payola. While making this video, this ad popped up distracting me from the hot influencers I was looking at. Tommy Rodriguez sells Amazon automation services and appears on Grant Cardone's show in this ad. What most people don't realize is this is paid marketing. He for sure paid Grant to be on his show to make it look like social proof. This is another version of Paola. To people who follow Grant, they probably think Tommy was hand selected out of all the possible guests and brought on because of his legitimacy, but to my knowledge, there's no disclosure of this financial partnership. The reason why Paola is illegal is because audience members of the media trust the gatekeeping nature of the influencers they follow. You believe someone is being promoted or someone's music is being played because of how good it is, but once you begin realizing how nearly everything in our life is pay for play, you start seeing how it's all a facade. That's a little history about Paola. I know some of you out there will want to do a deeper dive. I have two books over my right shoulder, Morris Levy, Godfather of the Music Business, and Dark Victory. You can also check out Michael Francis's YouTube video about Morris Levy's ties to the mob. I have an entire series on the music industry and why your favorite musicians are broke if you want to learn more about the industry as a whole. The videos are really interesting and the music business can be a 100 part series on its own. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.